You're very welcome along to the Keith Andrews Show in the hot seat for a limited time only. Today is Mr. John Malloy. Hey, Keith, how you doing? Hey, buddy. Good you're to getting, see you. You're going away one today. Listen, any day I get to see you, it's a great day. <laughs> How's your week been? Uh, very good, very good, yeah. very good, yeah. Um, I was over in Manchester for a couple of days with some Buddies. Uh, good mates, yeah, from home. How'd you get on? Great. We took in the press. Well, it was one all. It was Preston. one all. It was against Rotherham. Yeah. Preston are in like nineteenth yeah. in the table. Rotherham are twenty first. Yeah. So probably two sides not two sides not feeling great about yeah. life. But I mean, it was uh, it was really enjoyable. It was good, you know. And um, Deepdale's a lovely the stadium. First time you were there. Yeah. Deepdale's a nice I liked stadium. I like playing there. Yeah. Yeah. I did like playing there. They've just done a good job. It's intimate. There were eleven thousand there. There were seven hundred okay. Rotherham fans okay. who were down at one end. Yeah. And then there was eleven thousand, which I'm told is kind of like. <clears throat> your minimum attendance that they get yeah. and then Leeds might bring 5,000 the odd time or whatever yeah. but yeah. it was good you know I was saying to Kev actually one of the things which really struck me about it and it's a point that Kev has made before when we sometimes give out about well why don't players do it for Ireland mm. in a big way it, w it struck and Kev has made this point but it, it really struck me watching it how low key the whole thing was you know it wasn't a massive crowd there mm. were not many media there's not much kind of to a stop, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and then it must be a big change for the likes of Callum Robinson in particular now yeah, and Shawnee Alan Maguire. Brown and Shawnee Maguire and these lads coming over to a week of national media yeah. attention. Oh, the spotlight is huge. And it really struck me. I mean, Kev has made this point before. He's saying, you don't understand. He said, even in lower Premier League level, you don't get much personal scrutiny. You're in, you're out. Yeah. Like Callum Robinson, who was one of the best players in the pitch, if not the best player in the pitch. Yeah, I'll give you the best players in a sec, are the Irish lads. But um, he did miss a chance actually late on, mm. which could have won the game. And he did everything right. You know, there's a ball, he was at the back post and mm. defender committed himself. And he sort of peeled off, took it on his chest. Defender was out of it. Yeah. On his left foot, maybe a bit of an angle. Left-hand side of the goal. But it was a kind of tame right. side footed effort straight at the keeper. Like he should have walloped it. He should yeah. have done something with it. <clears throat> now look, the people of Preston have moved on. Mm. It hasn't been talked about for days on end. They probably have another game. That's where up. it is though, isn't it? Yeah. You're, you're right, and it's, it's it's interesting. You you look at that then in a different light. Mm. I mean, Kev's right, even lower Premier League, unless it's one of the a local derby or if it's a game on the telly when you have to do more media. Yeah. Like in the main you you don't really get tests. You can you get interview like requests just Back, back them away. off, yeah. just in and out, going about your business. Obviously, the, the spotlight goes on when it comes to results of you both ways. Mm. It's good, it goes on you, but I think, I think you're right. And then when those lads, it's very, very different for them. Very, that really struck me. Very average play, as I'm sure you know. You yeah, see there yourself. is, yeah. There's a lot of yeah. blocked crosses or a lot of nothing passes. Robinson, every time he got the ball, really almost every time, he did something very productive. Mm. Like, he was the best player on the pitch, maybe bar... Fella I'd never heard of before, Ben Pearson. Yeah, he's very good. In midfield. Very good. Came right. Yeah. Ben Pearson looked to me like a 34-year-old on player, the way down. Knows her, but he's only 20. And he's got a bit of tenacity. He does, yeah. Really, really good. You'd keep an eye out for him, yeah. Ben Pearson. He's like skin and long hair, number yeah. four, middle That's of the pitch. That's what Kev likes him. Time he got the ball, just their real playmaker. But the other More half, often than not, yeah. So the, the first half, the left-hand side was on the far side of the pitch yeah. to us. And it was all, it was a bit all frustrating, it was all down the left. Yeah. And I thought, if, they, if, they, if in the second half it's over on the far side, it won't <laughs> yeah, be happy. Yeah. But everything kept coming down to him. Right. Like, so Pearson and the other lads are getting the ball. I think they sensed that Robinson was having a good day yeah. and they kept giving it to him. And then there was um, Richie Towell for uh, Rotherham, must seem to do well. He was probably playing on the side that were going a bit direct. They had a big lad up front, so they lumped it up yeah, to him. So he, he didn't get on the ball much. He was yeah. just, honestly, he was just trotting up and trotting back and mm. trotting up and trotting back. Um, it's a struggle. And, yeah. It's a struggle for all of them and not in those players. It must be. The only other one then to mention is Shawnee Maguire came on somewhere kind of 65 minutes territory. Really good. Really, really good. Looked actually not a class above necessarily, but definitely an injection of pace yeah. and cuteness. <clears throat> Do you know what he had actually more than anything? He doesn't have like... 40 yard Stephen Gerrard kind of 10, power running. Yard sharp movements. Really sharp. Yeah. And he was bright. Yeah. Bright he was making really good runs. You know, I think he spotted Robinson was on top. Yeah. So then he started peeling off and making good runs between the right back and the centre half. And then Robinson was there and trying to create an overload. Yeah. And, you know, getting him behind and laying the back to Robinson. So really good. I like him. I like him. Yeah, I think no, he he'll probably well. get up to speed nicely before the, the next international break, which will be, um, which will be handy. Delighted to be joined on the line by Preston North End and Republic of Ireland, Callum Robinson. Callum, thanks for joining us, buddy. Uh, thank you. Thanks for having me. 
Listen, I want to want to start with you as a youth team player. Saved your apprenticeship at Villa. I just want to paint the picture for people who might not know entirely about you. Villa's, Villa's academy, it's produced a lot of players. Um, how, how were those days for you as a youth team player coming through there? Yeah, no, it's, um, it was really good and, and really enjoyable. Um, I started out there when I was eight years old um, and worked my way up um, on two-year contracts, what you get um, at them times. So worked my way up all the way through. Um, and then I struggled around under 14 times. I wasn't growing and um, I got given an extra extra year and a half um, just through, there was a coach called Sean Verity um, at the time and he, he was like, um, he's seen something in me, kept, kept me on for another year and a half and then over the half I excelled, I grew, um, I grew quite a bit and um, and then yeah, got to, got to under 16s, I was playing, um, I was playing up with the under 18s and uh, got my scholarship and a, a year pro, um, which was which was good. Obviously playing up with with the older I was playing in the youth cup, um, etc. Um, and then when I got to under 18s, um, I was with uh, Tony McAndrew, who really uh, really helped me. He's quite quite strict, uh, but it was you need that. I look back and you need that when you're uh, when I was like uh, 17, 18. Um, then I started playing up with the reserves with Kevin McDonald. Playing with uh, some obviously with some real good players, and and them days it was reserve league, so um, you're playing with three or four probably first teamers who aren't getting in the uh, in the squad at the time. So um, yeah, no, it was good. You served, you served a good apprenticeship, haven't you? Like by the sounds of that, I knew, I knew you'd come through a bit of a the way Villa's academy works, and especially with Kevin McDonald with the the twenty three years coach, stroke reserve yeah. coach. They they do instill those kind of old school qualities maybe would that be fair yeah definitely and and now I look back at 23 years old I look back and you and you now you realise how how much they had a part of me uh, playing now at a real good level um, as you said off the pitch you, you, you was always a little bit looking over your shoulder because they was on you uh, so much but at the end of the day it was it was def- it definitely helped me on and off the pitch um, the work ethic um Kevin McDonald used to do power hours on a Saturday morning, and at the time you're thinking, "Well, all the fitness intervals and stuff." But um, in the end of it, I got I got up to the top with the, with the first team um, at a young age. I was 18 when I was in the first team, so it was uh, it was obviously it all was worth it when 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 I look back now. Definitely, yeah. The next step, then, and I'm I'm a big big fan of the next step you made. So you go out, you go out, and you're in the big bad world of the football league. So very difficult to gate crash the first team at Villa, especially when they're in the Premier League. Big finances that they can go and buy players. So you go out and you start to earn your corn in the football league. Tell us a little bit how how difficult that was when you when you started to make those first few strides in the football league. Yeah. Um well, at the time, I think I played from, say, around December till the end of uh, one of the seasons in the Prem, like on the bench, and as you said, I got my five appearances, um, and then it got to the next pre-season, and I wasn't, I wasn't, I didn't feel like I was going to be obviously used as much, and I just saw, uh, I think, I remember sitting in the office with Paul Lambert, and he, he said, you can obviously stay and, and be around it again on the bench and I just thought I'd done that for which was a great experience but I'd done it for like six months the mm. season before and only made five sub appearances so then I just said like, I'd like to go on loan I'll, I'll, I'd want to go play and uh, I remember at the time I was I was like um, to my agent I wanted to go to the championship and uh, now I look back and it was uh, the best decision obviously to go to, to League One I, I don't think I probably would have been fully ready for a championship but I think when you're young you believe in yourself and uh and then I went to Preston, obviously Preston North End on loan in League One. Um, I think I got about 28 appearances, and and then that season, obviously we we went up, and it it was good to really uh, good to be around. As you said, you're around the team, you're in the first team dressing room. Um, it was quite hard, obviously, on the pitch because you're playing against men, and and now I look back and how my games developed as well in the positions I was getting. I'll stay out wide a little bit, a little bit more uh, then, and just think about one v ones where now. I like to get myself in pockets, etc. So, uh, but it was the best thing I probably was well, the best thing I've done because then in the end I I signed for Preston North End on the back of my loans there. So, 
um, it was a great decision for me. And I've, any young kid what comes in on loan at our place now I always says the, the best thing you'll do is, is getting men's football as, as early as possible. Yeah, look, I, I totally agree. I'm with you. For, absolutely. I've done the exact same thing myself. And that year that you were speaking about, that promotion year, it, you just had to show different traits. I was at and I remember playing against you in a couple of the big games. And you were favourites to go up automatically. Didn't quite happen. Yeah. We nipped you. But then the character then you've shown to get promoted. And then the way the club has gone from that. I know this season's been a little bit more difficult. But I think that's only because the bar that you've set at the club is very, very high. But your form has very much gone with the way the team has gone in the last few years. It must be very satisfying to see that kind of upward trajectory that you've been on. Yeah, um, yeah it's been great. And, and there's, as I said, there's being players who are still still around it, even like the likes of Gally, uh, the skipper Clarky, there's and then at the time obviously me and Brownie were like really young and, and it's nice and uh, Daniel Johnson's still lads there, there's still a core there where we've done we've developed and, and went forward with the club and it was a great obviously a great season that we've done it in the end and uh and then to get into the championship and then I I come back on loan there that Christmas of the first year in the champ and and yeah it's just been it's just been literally like just been going more positive and up as the as the years have been going on. I was a little bit disappointed at the moment, considering how we ended last season. But the, the st- what we did last season and what everyone always says about the budgets and stuff like that um, was, if we could have nipped that uh, playoffs, it would have been obviously unbelievable. But um, we got some yeah some real good players, and as you said, myself personally, I've developed as well as the team over the last two three years, definitely. Every every step you've taken up, you've you've done it. Kind of, I know it hasn't it probably hasn't been easy, but it certainly looked easy. And the you know League One Championship, Championship nearly to the playoffs last year. The team did really really well. The bar was set very very high. And this year, international football. Tell tell us a little bit about because I don't think a lot of people realise how how has it come about. Is it your grandmother's from Monaghan? Is that right? From Monaghan, yeah. So basically, it's kind of funny because. Uh, I think I was under the fifth play. I was going to play for Ireland in two games against Hungary, and uh, basically they couldn't they couldn't find my grandma's because um, basically my grandma passed away when my mum was not stuck, um, and my granddad remarried. So it was, it was it was kind of like hard, and I think under fifteens people sort of, sort of give up a little bit early. And to be fair to Marco Tull, he, he he was helping a lot, and uh, in the end we just couldn't we just couldn't. Hit it, but then uh, I think it was about a couple of seasons ago, and I, I really, I really wanted to, really wanted to do it. And my mum was like pushing me to do it, but I was a little bit in between being in a championship, a lot of games, and and my body was still obviously growing. And it was like, yeah. oh, do I, do I put it out there that I want to? And and it, it was like that for a couple of years. And then uh, my good friend Fads, and I spoke to him. Um, and I was just like, I, re- I really want to do it. I, like, I'm really interested. And I spoke to Brownie, obviously, at the club, and then Shawnee Maguire come in, and, and they was just like, do it. It would be obviously great for you and, and great for the country, etc. Yeah. And um, and then, yeah, I think it was last March, um, I have just put out there, I just put an article, they put an article out saying that I really want to have done an interview. And, uh, and then, obviously, from there, I played in the Celtic testimonial, um... The gaffer rang me and just said like he'd like me to get around the boys. And then I was just waiting on my passport. And then, as, as you've said, the last couple of months now I've been involved and I've, I've loved literally every minute of it. The lads are great, staff are great, and I'm I'm just I'm really enjoying it. Generally enjoying it. And I was, as I said, like for my, especially for my mum, it's it's obviously proud every time I step out and and play. So it's a, it's annoying that obviously it didn't go through when I was younger, but. At least I got there in the end. So. Yeah, so it's a combination of obviously the family background, your mate Kieran Fadden, who who put us in touch as well. So we should thank him for that, and also yeah, the, the Preston Mafia, where all the Irish players there yeah. urging you to uh, yeah. to push on. So tell us a little bit about the step up. So we keep on talking about League One Championship, Championship, one of the top players in the Championship. Your goals, the positions you're picking up, getting lots of plaudits and rightly so. Yeah, um, I, I actually. I've actually been enjoying it, but it's obviously disappointing with the results we're getting um, at the moment. But I've I've really I've really enjoyed it because you're playing with some like some some real good players. Do you know what I mean? And um, and I've actually genuinely been enjoying it. I think 
the difference between, obviously, I would say championship and and the international football. If, if you lose the ball, you, you don't get it back as quick yeah. because the level and the the, the players that you're playing with, uh, sorry, playing against, uh, are very good, and you're playing with some some very quality professionals. So it's one of them where you you have to look after the ball uh, when you have it. Um, but yeah, I'd say definitely, I've, I've I've really been enjoying it, and in training, I've I've loved it, and I've just tried to be as confident as and as positive as possible and hopefully that's obviously shown in, in some of the little bits of I've had game time that I've uh, as well because sometimes you know as a player you respect off the players but getting my feet up with international football and and yeah just been, I've just been really enjoying it yeah I think you have been I would only imagine that the players are absolutely taking you on board because with the, the type of pace the power that you have we need that type of player in amongst us I'm a striker or I'm a 10 or I'm a wing eyes but I just literally now I've sort of found a position where I've been playing on the left a lot but I'm not really playing on the left if you get what I mean yeah. I'm playing as like a, as like say a left striker if you get what I mean in, in, in certain games I'm playing as a striker but slash on the left side um, where I can still have my 1v1s and get out players but then if you see most of my goals this season they're in striking strikers positions they're in the six yard box mm. um, where that's where I get most of my goals So and that's being in a striker position but then I'm not playing as a striker so it's one of them where wherever I am in in that attacking area in the final third I, I'm, I always just want to be getting on the ball etc it doesn't mean if I'm up front or on the on the wing or wherever like I'm and I'm not just saying that obviously to keep my options open mm. literally now you don't you know when you get to an age you want to be you want to know exactly but as long as I'm in them areas and I'm making sure that I'm in the box as a striker when the ball's getting in the box but then sometimes I might drop into pockets as I've just said there um, and pick up the ball on a half turn so literally anywhere in that final third I'm, I'm, I enjoy I enjoy just being around the, in every attack basically Callum, I think as long as you keep on that upward trajectory, you're going to be absolutely fine and be a, a big part of what both Preston and Ireland do. You've got Ipswich on Saturday. Wish you good luck at that and hopefully we'll touch base soon, pal. Oh, thank you very much. Cheers to you. Delighted to be joined in the studio by a former teammate of mine for both club and countries, Keith Tracy. Keith, thanks for coming in. No problem, Take bud. Time you got a little bit lost on the way. Uh, yeah, I was nearly in the Viva at one point, but we got here in the end. <laughs> Found your way over. Desperate to get back on that pitch, I'm <laughs> walking over there, man. <laughs> right, before we get into some the nitty gritty, I want to I want to bring you right back because something I'm quite passionate about is underage football, grassroots. We would have had similar type of upbringings in terms of the DDSL. Yeah. Um, you obviously came from Sheriff Street, played for Belvo. Mm -hmm. Tell us a little bit about. DDSL and the upbringing and the, the kind of apprenticeship it gave you did you think it was a, a good competitive league to give you that basis to go to England um, yeah I always enjoyed playing for Belvedere it's because there's so many teams within Dublin you know when you're in school your mates always play for the local teams as well so you're constantly fighting with your mates and Belvedere was never the best team at my age but it was a team that I was invested in and my family were invested in so even though I was from Sherry Street Sherry Street were starting to come on the up and there was numerous opportunities to go to Sherry Street, but I loved that Belvedere, and they they always looked after me, even when I was leaving to go to England. They were always uh, in touch, and always, even now, we still get a, a birthday card off the, the manager. Yeah, I do. So, who was your the, manager? A fella called Jared Mooney. Right. And, uh, yeah, he still keeps in touch. He's like a family friend now. So I think I was quite lucky. And was Vinny Butler still involved? That says we were a different team. Maybe, I'm not sure it? what Vinny's doing. Vinny's uh, he's a family friend of my nanny and granddad's, and is they he? sort of keep in touch with him. This and that. I don't. Uh, I know he done a, an interview the other day about underage football yeah. himself and had a bit of a. a I bit think of a he is still that. involved. I've seen yeah. games and just I haven't seen Vinny in years. And he would have been one of the managers who I would have been coming up against. I was still a Mars, and obviously they were a bit of a, a bit of a rival. But yeah. in, in terms of that kind of attention that you got from across the water. It was a the real interest from Celtic at one stage, wasn't it? Yeah, well, I was actually in Parkhead, ready to uh, ready to sign. I had the contract in front of me, my whole family with me. And uh, the only reason I didn't sign, Tommy Bones was there at the time. And what age were you then? I was twelve, thirteen. No, I was young. I was a little bit older. They they did try and get me at thirteen, <coughs> but we kept on. I was too young, so me, yeah, even my man and dad knew. Off. 
I think this was around 14, just maybe 15. But uh, I wanted to stay in the digs. I had Darno D, had a couple of Irish lads there, and he had a snooker table. And I was like, I was quite shy, so I was like, as long as I get into that house, I'll be fine. Mm. And at the last minute, they literally tapped me on the shoulder and said, that house won't be ready for six months, but you'll be straight in after six months. Right. And I gave one look to, gave one look to my mother. Off. Yeah, gave one look to my mother, it? and she went, she's not happy. Oh, he's not happy. And that was the end of it. Never turned back. And then Blackbone came in, and she was quite happy with Blackbone and my mother again because... Because of the big like, situation. Yeah, it was like Emmerdale Farm. There was yeah. nowhere to get in trouble. That was actually whole woods. You won't get in trouble here. So, yeah, now I fell in there. So we're Blackbone in the equation from the off or did that just happen after Celtic? Uh, no, Blackburn were always number one, so to say, but with Scotland not having a, a youth system, yeah. I was going to be on £300 a week at 14, 15. Yeah. That was my money that my dad was pulling in, so we were like, I was going to go for it just for that reason, yeah. just for the money, and uh, thank God I didn't because I think I would have been quite limited on what happened in my career if I had gone up there. Yeah. So, similar to myself, I think, Junior set, bang, straight yeah, over. Done. We homesick. What, how did it work? Because when I went over, I went over at 15, literally after the junior set, I had a family holiday in Galway for four or five days and then straight over, joined the pre season a year younger because in England, obviously, the education system's a little bit, yeah. the GCSEs are a, a year later, so we would have been a year younger. I was quite fortunate. I, I joined with five Irish lads. There was five of us yeah. that were kind of thick as thieves. Robbie came as one. The other lads didn't didn't go on to make it, unfortunately. But you had something similar at Blackburn, and it was a few years, wasn't it? Yeah, I had a few of the boys. But to be fair, when I signed, they all sort of fell away because Sioness signed me. Mm. Well, not Sioness, but you know, he was the he was the head, he was the manager. And we got to meet him, and I think after two weeks, he went to Newcastle. Mm. So that fell through. But because, like I say, when I went over, I was 15. Hush, hush. Mm. And when the A teams had a game, if the first team didn't have a game in the weekend, if you had a Monday night game, they'd throw me in with the first team to train. And quickly, Mark Hughes gave me a new contract, and it all just, I just really steamrolled into a career and ended it very abruptly as well. Tell us a little bit about those those first few weeks, though. So you go over. You used to obviously living at home, living in Sheriff, playing for Belvo, and then if anybody hasn't, most people won't have the, the the dig situation at Blackburn. It was basically all of the the U team players were were in there, weren't they? With yeah. Mary and Mick, wasn't it? There was uh, sixteen bedrooms, two lads to a bedroom. Yeah, and it was me. And, you remember Frankie? Frankie yeah, Fielding. Yeah, yeah. I was in with Frankie, and uh, yeah, he's a good lad, isn't he? Yeah, he was a good lad. He got a bit. Uh, Fun time, Frankie had a few nicknames, didn't he? He was a bit weird, but he, he settled me in. Me and Frankie were roommates for the whole time. I think I lived in that house for three years, and then I ended up, yeah, I got my own house when I was just turning 18, so that was really good. Who were the other Irish lads there at the time? Was it Gavin uh, Cunning and Gav was there. younger? Gav was a little bit younger, Arden Dorr, and came later. Oh, Alan George was, he came six months later. I don't know why that was. He didn't come the same time as me. Right. He came, whether it, he was looking at other clubs or whatever, but you remember Eddie Nolan? Yeah, yeah. He was there. Was was like was top and Gavin Pearce yeah. was there. He was a little yeah. bit older, and there was a load of Duffer was there. Yeah, but like I say, he went to Chelsea Sharpish as well. Yeah. He was so, scared of that's one. <laughs> yeah, well, Jesus, that wasn't much to live up to, was it? Walking so who, who was the U team manager? Uh, the U team manager was Gary Bowyer. Ah, oh, was he? Yeah. Was it Kerry Bow? Yeah, I thought it was um, Kelly. Do you remember Kelly? Uh, he was there initially. Rob Kelly. Rob Kelly. Yeah, yeah. he loved and me. He left. He loved me as a winger because he was always on at me, on at me. So oh, we love you here. We love you. He was one of the reasons. We're like, yeah, this yeah. fella's really nice. I'm going to come here. And again, two weeks later, he was out Thanks. the bleeding door. So yeah, all the all the reasons I signed for left me straight away. So how did you take to the training, the full time training, and the the kind of the rigour of that going from prime probably twice a week with Belva playing the weekend and you might play on the streets mm -hmm. with your mates. How did, how, did, how did you take to that? Uh, it was fairly easy, to be honest. Because at that age, you're not really, you know, fitness doesn't really come into at 15. Mm -hmm. You're just running around, running after a ball with your mates. And oh. I was, I, when I first went over, I wanted to prove something to the English players because they've been in academies longer than me and they've all come through. And, you know, the under-15s Blackburn players walked around with a bit of a swagger, whereas I was under-15s Belvedere just mm. coming over. So we always felt like I had a bit to prove, so we'd always train a little bit harder and mm. you know, leave a bit on the English lads and just let them know that, you know, just because I've come from Dublin doesn't mean I'm any less good a player as you. And mm. that was always the bit I had between my teeth and, you know, we got on to win that left later, I suppose. Yeah. Well, so when you went over then, I remember... I was a little bit the same. That was five Irish lads I went over with, and there was a couple of older ones there as well. We used to have five-a-sides against the English lads, and there was that little bit of 
niggle yeah. between the two. I don't, think the, I don't think the manager particularly helped by constantly putting us on the same teams. He used to do Ireland versus England and all the rest of it. So there was that element yeah. of a little bit of niggle. The other area I wanted to speak to you was Connor Clifford done a good article recently in, in, in an interview. And he was speaking about the pressure of having to have the Louis Vuitton wash bag, having to have, and I remember even going back to my time, the certain type of runner, the certain type of yeah. trainer. There was that little bit of pressure. Was that something that was evident at, at Blackburn? Uh, it was evident, yeah. It passed me over. I'm sure you remember. I had, I was getting uh, called a pike and all sorts, but I lived in the dig, so I only ever come down in a pair of shorts, you know, ready to mm. go into my training gear. So I sort of avoided all that stuff, but it was, yeah, it was evident. I knew there's probably players before you came to Blackburn like uh, Jamal Johnson and yeah. there was people like that to just they go out and bike like I bought a Range Rover at 17 I didn't even have a driver's license or anything like it mm. and it's just them things that are trying to be like the people around you and yeah you get like too much too quick I was at you were sorry you were 18 I went to Blackburn in August 2008 so you would have been 18 then wouldn't you yeah 18 maybe, no maybe 17 Going I don't on know, I'm not going to pretend next, like I'm walking out these next numbers. Next year, so, um, we're born the same day, remember? Are you 13? Yeah, 13 September, yeah. Oh, right. Yeah, so. Do you remember that? And Carl Robinson was as well. Remember at the time when he was at, at Blackburn as the coach? No, we'd never have remember that, that at all, no. Well, obviously a few years different, yeah, so we're a bit younger. Yeah. Um, so when I moved there, I was really aware of you as this young Irish lad coming through and you made, you made the, the comparison of or sorry, a lot of people are making the comparison of the new Damien Dolphin. Yeah. So, moved there, and in my first game, we are playing at Upton Park, and I don't know whether you remember this, got brought on at half-time, Vince Corelli, who, to be fair to Vinny, I think, <laughs> struggled with yeah, the, uh, Vince, the yeah. tempo of, of, of the game and came off at half-time. I've never seen anybody have so much cramp yeah. at half-time in a game. His legs could not move at half-time. He was on the floor. Yeah, well, I bet his hair still looked great, didn't it? <laughs> Yeah, looked a million dollars. Um, but then you came on in that game as well. I came on at halftime and then bang. So you're, you're in and around it, straight yeah. in the off, playing. And then that was obviously Paul Ince was the manager. I think he showed a lot of belief in you, but like yeah. things were flying. Yeah. Weren't yeah. they? Things were flying there, but like when you come in, you, you obviously only seen me getting into the team, but mm. under Mark Hughes, I was in every squad, travelling everywhere, and you know, would never get to the pitch. It was everything but getting onto the pitch, yeah. and when Ince came in, he uh, did you play in that game against Everton? Remember the first no, game? No, I saw the day after. Yeah, that was four I, one, wasn't it? Uh, yeah, we were. I think we were losing one away, day. away to Everton, wasn't yeah. it? Yeah, uh, first game of the season, and he, I was sitting there, and somebody turned around and said, "Keith, go and warm up," and I was like, "Not nah, bringing me <coughs> on, we're losing like in Goodison Park. He ain't bringing me on." And he turned and said, "Keith, come on." I was like. Making a mistake here. Yeah. <laughs> I was absolutely panicking. But take that really? I was panicking because the crowd is so close. Well, yeah, like I thought, yeah. if I win in three 0 I just a chance to bring on, me on and you know blood minutes. me a bit. But yeah. this was, I suppose, yeah, he showed a lot of faith in me there, and I think we we ended up winning. So that was a great confidence mm-hmm. booster for me. And I remember that West Ham game as well. Yeah. Bellers was playing, wasn't he? Yeah. And he was having a go at Lucas Neal about getting tight to me. Yeah. yeah. And he was calling me all sorts of names while he was telling him to get tight, but. Yeah, that was the type of fellow Bellers was as well. So you've, you've talked about the, the range of, and I remember that. So I remember coming to the club and hearing loads about you, seeing it then with my own eyes, seeing how good you were, how good you could be. And then I'm looking at you some mornings and I'm thinking, you were out last night or you were out two nights in the bounce. And yeah. then, oh my, I'm, 20, I'm 28 at the time, then going on 28. And look, I've been there. Look. Mm-hmm. See it, and so there's, there's a fine line between looking at you and thinking, I don't want to be a dad here, I don't want to be yeah. like on you all the time. But then it's a fine line between that and then trying to give you some kind of guidance, some kind of advice. Yeah. And it, it's difficult because you've, you've got all this potential. And I know, I know there was a lot of the senior players trying to yeah. kind of curb you and the Range Rover story. Like, what was the Range Rover story about the lads off the bus? Um, so you get back from an away game. You might you'll have to fill in the blanks here because I've heard this second tour at hand. Yeah, yeah. And I think Graham Souness was the manager. Um, no, it must have been. No, it was Mark it Hughes was the manager. Sparky, yeah. yeah. So Mark Hughes is the manager. Mm. And at the end, at the end of the game, you get back to the stadium or the training ground, and the usual t- story is the staff and the young players get the stuff off the the bus, yeah. the kit, the the skips, all the rest of it. And as Mark Hughes looks around. You're whizzing past in your Range Rover. 
Um, I, I honestly don't remember. I, it sounds like something I'd have done, but not. Nah, I wouldn't have done it on purpose. I wouldn't have yeah. done. I'm doing good with this. I probably, I probably played and thought I don't have to do it today because yeah, I played. Yeah. Yeah. It would have been something like that, but obviously I, I had that bit of arrogance about me, and people probably rubbed a lot of people up the wrong way at the time. But I think I, it was I, more I frustration. Know. I don't think it was arrogance. I think it was frustration. I think mm. everybody was probably in the same boat as me. Staff members. Um, and not just coaching staff, like the medical staff at Blackburn was quite tight around that time. Yeah. And they try and chip in and try and give you that little bit of advice. I think the main thing was frustration because we, everybody could see yeah. how much quality, how much potential that you had. And it was just a case of just, just curbing that. So, like, s Saturday night, what, what would be the drill after the game? Was it literally full blast? Uh, well, Blackburn wasn't really the problem for the drinking. The drinking kicked in Preston when I when I really, although it was the championship, that was when I really started to kick on. I, I was a big fish at Preston. That was when the drinking started. Preston, oh, sorry, Blackburn was, people expected me to do things and I'd always do just enough of what they'd be like, like you say, you seeing a flash of it and you're like, oh gee, he is as good as people say, but I would never deliver, deliver it when I should. And Why I, did you think that was? Eh. Uh, like when you look back, because again, when I like, when I, I early stages of my career, I had really frustrating times, and I, drinking culture was massive yeah. in football. So, and it wasn't a case of just me; it was everybody. So it was it was one of those. But like when I look back, and in the years that have gone past, like I do look in the mirror, I do look towards managers, I do look towards senior players. Could they have helped me a little bit more? Where where, where do you stand on it? Um, geez, I'd be cockeyed if I was trying to look at people for whose problem it was. But <clears throat> mostly, I'd look at myself. But the certain things, like Phil Brown, when he, he was manager at Preston, he didn't help. Mm. But the, the earliest memory I have of Blackburn is meeting Dominic Matteo and Gary Flickroft. Yeah. I, I, some Senior players. silly bleeding hamstring injury, but I was in the gym and I ended up with them two. And there, Flicky, Flicky was the, the captain, captain at the time. And he said to me, never miss a night out. Never, ever miss a night out, because before you know it, your career will be over. And I took him literally on that. Mm. Obviously, I shouldn't have, but... At 15, you know, do you, mean, do you mean like team bonding? Is that what he meant? I'm not sure, but I never missed any night out. Now, whether it was drinking, go kart, whatever it was, I was there and I, it just sort of struck me and I couldn't deal with the ups and downs of the game. So, drinking was always uh, an escape for me. And I was always young enough and fit enough to be able to have a couple of points and get away with it, have a couple of points, get away with it. But it starts, you know, you're burning the candle at both ends, it eventually will come to get you. And, so what happened after that? Oh, when did it? What, you're saying that was really the time. When did it start escalating? And then what? What happened? Was it just? Uh, it became a constant. Yeah, it became a constant because I was living in between uh, Preston and Blackpool in a place called Lytham. So mm. <clears throat> if I go to Preston, I can drink till you know half one, two o'clock in a studenty place. If I go to Blackpool, I can stay up till whatever time, the next day if I want. Mm. So it was never really a situation I can't go out tonight. I would always go out knowing I have a recovery day the next day, but I'd be stinking a drink the next day with the booze and yeah, pre you know, Phil Brown used to I was getting injections before every game. I wasn't training. I never ever trained at uh, twenty one. I wouldn't be on but again I seen that with remember Rocky used to do it. He used to not train, he used to be Man Friday. He'd come out and train on Friday, scored on a Saturday. Yeah. And they, they were the, Cruz, yeah, yeah, the type of people I was looking up to. And I was like, yeah, I'll do that. I just won't train and I'll play and turn it on and turn Obviously it off. Obviously, that was a different different end of the spectrum. He's mm. whatever he was. Yeah, but late 20s, you're 21. So, like, what, what were you getting injections for? Uh, I had a double hernia that they didn't want to operate on because we were in a dogfight at the relegation end. Yeah. So, uh, he was just, just getting injections and injections. And <laughs> it got to the point where my arse had so many uh, needle points in it that they had to start giving me suppositories then. Seriously? Yeah, it was Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday, Tuesday, and I just, I wouldn't, like, my arse was like a dartboard at one stage, <laughs> it was a joke. But that was it, I, I wasn't big a man enough to say, listen, I'm gonna, I'm not playing today, because you be don't, don't that's, do that. That's, that's, there's, there's got to be a duty of care as well when it comes to mm. the, the medical side, and I, I don't know what you felt, I felt that Blackburn as well, that was probably one of the strongest medical yeah. departments in terms of they would stand up for the players' rights. I think look. Dave Fever had a lot to do with that. I think yeah. he, he was he knew what he was doing. He was really 
he used to ring me mar at home and all. He had that little personal mm. touch, you know. Not not an injury, you know. If I was ill and I was in up in the digs, he would ring me mother and say, "Listen, it's only a touch of a cold. Don't worry about it." Yeah, Blackburn had that little personal touch that was attracted me to him. Speak, speaking of your mum and your family, like when like when this was going on at, at Preston in particular, when it was like you're going out Saturdays or kicking on or midweeks and all. Did they have any idea? Um, I think they knew I was ill, but what was what was the what else was I going to do? They didn't want me sitting in the house getting depressed. So mm. them saying I was out having a drink, they probably thought, oh, well, everybody's out having a drink. But you know, they they were they never had a footballer as a son before, so they didn't know which way to guide me. And I was telling them everything was all right, and they'd see me on the telly once a month playing half decent or getting an Ireland cap, and they'd be like, everything's fine. Yeah, and y- you. Half the time I'd lie to myself in the mirror saying everything's fine, you know. How can things be wrong if I'm playing for Ireland and playing for Preston and yeah. week in, week out? Yeah. And, uh, I would have yeah, been in the same boat. I would have been similar to that in the way that you just try to make it sound like it's so and they see you every now and again, they speak you on the phone and they don't really know the full extent yeah. of exactly what you're going through. Like, I, I wanted to knock football in the head when I was... 21, 20, 22, 23, I'd say. Yeah. I nearly went to America, I nearly went on a um, scholarship to, to New York and go and play over there because I'd had enough of it. Yeah. I'd had enough of the culture, I'd had enough of the way I was getting treated by Wolves at the time. Yeah. And I've said to you, as well, like, it just wasn't right for me. Just just totally fell out of love with, with football. Didn't even want to train. Yeah. It was a horrible position to be in. Did you ever, did you ever get to that level? Uh, Many, many times. Like even when things were going well, and I scored a goal, I'd wake up the next morning and go, "I can't be bothered doing this." Mm. And it's just, a, it's not really nice. And when did the depression kick in? Like I know you've spoke about that in the last couple of years, but and at the time you didn't. You were saying it's been you've had it for years yeah. on and off, and like what, like when when you look back now, when do you think it started or what started it? Um. In, in the nicest possible way, what started it was probably me and my wife, my me, me wife to be at the time, and I was I was floating through life in England, you know, I was just playing games. Eventually, things weren't going well for me at Barnsley, and I, ju- I didn't have the bite between my teeth to get myself going again. I I couldn't kickstart myself, and my wife and the kids were at home. I was like, this just isn't weighing up here for me. The pro the cons were outweighing the pros all of a sudden, and I just I actually we were playing Preston at home and in. in uh, Sorry, in deep there. So I was allowed to stay at home on Christmas Day. And I woke up Christmas, uh, sorry, Boxing Day, and there was blood all over the, the sitting around floor. Like, and the taxi driver who was coming to get me to bring me to the game was like, he wanted to ring me, man, that was like blood. And I got up and got dressed, got cleaned myself up, and went to do the warm up. And I, as I, he put me on the bench, thank God, I thought it was actually due to play. As, as I turned, we were doing little sprints, and as I turned to sprint, the stadium just started to turn black and black. I couldn't see. And I made some excuse that I had a flu or something and went in, and I was, he told me to sit behind the bench, mm. and I rang my wife like on the slide behind the bench, and that was it. We went home that day. I, I didn't even tell the club. They actually sent me letters six months later saying, uh, you've been sacked and blah blah but <laughs> this was six months ago. and that's But that's... The life of a footballer, it's up and down and up and down. Uh, they wasn't they didn't help you at all, though, to try and deal with that. Or because no. there's a lot, there's a lot made as well about the PFA. Now, I have, I don't want to be too critical of them, but I think they're very reactive. They're not proactive. Yeah, yeah. Um, so if something comes out, they'll jump on that. Yeah. But they do anything to try and help. Um, not. It was somebody from the PFA, Clark Carlisle tried to help me a lot, but it wasn't in the PFA capacity, if you know what I mean. It was as a mate because I played with him at uh, Burnley and he was coming over to Preston at the time. And I, I see myself and Clarkie a lot now. So the only person I would listen to was Clarkie. Mm. And he had a great way about him. He was really, such a nice fella. And the way he spoke to me really opened my eyes. But there was still a little blip mm. after Clarkie that I had to get over. And I think you really have to, re- you have to hit that rock bottom and you have to either say, am I going to, get straight and keep going or am I just going to try and live my life and I, I remember did you ever play with Wayne Henderson? Yes. I remember he, he came into my house and lit him crying one day after a Preston game he was on the bench and he, he just slammed a whiskey bottle down and he's like I don't think I'll be able to pick my kids up when they're born he, he hasn't got any kids but because his back was so bad he started sobbing and I was like this is a grown man crying like picking your kids up is more important than playing a game of football to me and I always will be so 
when I seen Hendo doing that, I was thinking and thinking, if I keep drinking and keep playing here, and I, cu I couldn't stop the drinking at the time, so I kept drinking and playing, but eventually I got to a good enough place where, you know, I'm, I, don't, I haven't drank since November now, so... So you're nearly a year off. Of nearly a year off, of, yeah, but Christmas is coming up, so who knows? <laughs> now, everything's... I'm, this is three years of therapy later, you know, to get all this stuff out, and like I say, I, I like talking about it now because I think it's... A lot of people need to you. hear this. Yeah, well... Did you, did you know any of this stuff no, when you went over? No, it's no, it's no. all rose and you're going to be a First and foremost, it's got to help you. Like, it's got to, it's got to be beneficial for you. And I think, like, the, I read the article a few weeks ago yeah. in the Herald and I was... Honestly, I felt so bad. I felt so bad that I should have done more, I could have done more to try and help you when when I was at Blackburn, but then don't realise to the extent and then you go off and you're playing at you're playing at Burnley, you're playing at Preston and obviously I don't I'm not seeing you on a daily yeah. basis then. But that, that's not that's no like although I was a child, I, I wasn't nobody it's nobody's duty to mind me there when we're on the football pitch and but that was it. I what did we train from half ten till half twelve and I'd be back in my house at half twelve and you know what two and a half grand a week sitting in the house. What are you going to do at mm. 17, 18? There's only one thing on my mind. And um, unfortunately, it was on my mind till I was a lot older to reverse what I'd done to my body. What's the plan now? So is it a constant battle to try and stay on top of this with the, the people you have around now, good people? You just mentioned your wife, you just had a baby as well. Uh, it's not a battle anymore. Um, at the start, it was a battle, but... At the start, I didn't realise I was trying to give up drink. I thought I was just, I'll uh, give it two weeks if I can. And, you know, you start to stretch it and stretch it and stretch it. And before I knew it, I'm sitting here, I'm nearly a year off and I have no no ambition to go back to it at all. No ambition to go back to drink. What about football? Uh, if you're not ask, playing at the moment, eh? Not playing at the moment, but... <sighs> if you put that in a box, like you were saying, and you're kind of saying, that's just not important. Not, not important anywhere not, near as much well, as the... The family side of things and what you want to do. Yeah, well, I, like you say, we're only we only had a, a little boy two weeks ago, so giving football another thought. I, I would love to play, but I'd love to play for like uh, Sherry or East Wall, just an, an amateur thing and just to enjoy, just have a bit of laugh again, and not you know people going, oh, your touch was poor there, or you should have pressed there. It's just forget the tactics and have a game of football. Can like, you remember enjoy. the last time you played football and enjoyed it? Uh, I don't think I ever enjoyed a professional game of football. It's more... You're, you're even, do, even Ireland? Even Ireland was... It was more nerve-wracking to think what could go wrong rather than what could I actually go and achieve here. It was, right, just keep it steady, just don't do anything stupid here, Keith. And that's always what I wanted to do, was just, right, don't do anything stupid rather than actually going and Whereas your on. game is the total opposite. Right? You, you had the attributes to, to be the game-changer. You were the, like... Yeah, the duff, you know, like with those type of qualities. So, like, to, to imagine that you were even thinking that kind of the game, because if I was with you and you were playing regular, I'd be like literally wanting to get you the ball mm. to win us games. But you were thinking, yeah. it's down to anything wrong. Well, I, I did a lot of that could have been to do a trap as well. He was that way minded, especially mm. with his wingers. He didn't want to leave the defensive side to uh, to expose, but. Yeah, I was always like that. It was always, and I know when I come on against Argentina, I I done okay. I went past Zabaleta a few times, but people made a big thing about that. Like, oh, you just skinned Zabaleta. At the time, he was an aging man, and I was coming into my prime, and well, my prime what was it, like twenty one or something? Mm. But yeah, it did turn out to be my prime, didn't it? Yeah, well, uh, I don't think I enjoyed it. I actually get the first thing I did after that game was go down and give my granddad my jersey because it was his birthday and he was down in Rings End. So I, I literally I walked from the Aviva to just like I did today, back down <laughs> to uh, my granddad and gave him the jersey. And it was more I was really proud to be able to give him my jersey rather than like enjoying the game of football itself. It was have you did you enjoy football games? Yeah, I did, yeah. Yeah? Yeah. You seem surprised. I did, and you I definitely was a very enjoyed. angry man on, on the pitch you were. Yeah, that's the I way I played. Yeah. That's the way I played. I was really highly strong and I was mm. really... You'd probably testify to this. few other lads have said I was always moaning and shouting and screaming. And yeah. But I, I, I loved that battle side of it. Whereas yeah. I had different... I was saying I had different qualities to you. So what, I felt like that side of my game would get the best out of you yeah. if I got you at it and was giving you the ball and scrapping in midfield and doing, doing certain things. Depends yeah. what club I was at. But yeah, I definitely enjoyed it. And with, with Ireland, it was just... Loved every second of it. Yeah, well, don't get me wrong. I was, I was extremely proud and all that stuff. I was delighted to do it, but did I actually enjoy the game? 
No, particularly, no. It was when you look back now, where where would you where would you change it? What point do you think then I should have changed it? So again, like certain parallels I spoke to you about I was willing to give up football, didn't like it. I had to get out of Wolverhampton. I went to Hull, hated Hull. I yeah. felt like I was living in Russia. It was like <laughs> the far end of the bleeding earth. It was ridiculous. So it wasn't until I went to MK Dons that I actually fell back in love with football again. You were, you were speaking about, I just want to go and enjoy football. That's where I started to enjoy football yeah. again. And it was from then. Whereas, could have easily, you know, if that didn't go well, just yeah. fall out. And what was I then? I was 25, maybe. Well, I think that happened to me at uh, Preston to a certain extent. But even when I left Blackburn, do you remember when I, I crashed my car? Mm. You, were, you were training that day, yeah. right? And Sam Allardyce wouldn't even speak to me. He sent me in and... Uh, Dr. Bat, you had to break me to do is mm. get out and blah de blah. But <sighs> some of the things that went on, like behind the scenes, Irish, young Irish 15 year old will never know these things. And like, how do you, how do you speak? There's nobody there. Like, remember our own hands used to yeah. do, but there's nobody there. And I think there is a real need for that. A, there is a need for somebody to speak to them and just to advise. Say, them. listen, if, if you don't, if you're not the next Damien Duff, mm. don't worry about it. I, like, Somebody going into your man dad at 13 saying this fella's going to be the next name in Duff, there's going to be millions. Like, I remember my ma looking at houses out in Bray, and like, that's the sort of pressure that's getting thrown on you. Like, I'm inverting you now, like, they weren't doing it on purpose, but these little things are just on your back, and you're like, I'm trying to just have a game of football here, and it goes out of it, the fun goes out of it with, with the professionalism. Mm. Listen, we could go on talking about this forever. I'm glad you're looking well. I'm glad things are going well in terms of being off the drink. Stay strong, all right? Yeah, of course, but it's been a pleasure. Delighted to say I've got John Williams on the phone. Um, covers all the Bournemouth games. Uh, bumped into you at the weekend, John. I've, we've met each other a couple of times, but Saturday was the first time we met properly at the, the Fulham Bournemouth game on Saturday when they were so impressive. Um, it's going very, very well, isn't it, at the moment for Bournemouth? Yeah, good afternoon, everybody over there. Um, it is going really well for us. We've hit a vein of form uh, that we've never quite had in the Premiership uh, you know, we'll talk about Fulham first, and it was a really good performance, clinical finishing. Um, the KFC, as I call them, uh, 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 Kingy, uh, Fraser and Callum, yeah. are absolutely outstanding. They've got enormous pace and strength, and they're a real threat every time we play somebody. Fulham in particular, I felt, you know, they had a lot of possession, but really didn't hurt us too much goalkeeper-wise, not many shots at all. For them, uh, you know, they're going to have to adjust to life in the Premiership. And then Eddie makes eight changes last night. The most interesting thing about it was, though, he played three of the lads who played on Saturday, you know, uh, and it, that's quite unusual, you know, to Cookie Francis. Um, Charlie Daniels, was it? And Charlie Daniels, yeah. He mm. left Aki out, of course, which make, would may have made it even stronger. Mm. But Norwich were very impressive. And um, Eddie wasn't at all happy with performance. But, you know, when you win and you're not playing too good, he, I think it might. it's about momentum sometimes. And when I've been in that sort of role of games myself, you sort of, you expect to win, mm. you know, no matter what happens. And that, that was the case last night. I think, I think that sums things up quite nicely, doesn't it? The fact that win 3-0 at, at a team like Fulham on Saturday, OK, they've got their problems. Then you come into a cup, a cup game and you're not quite happy with the level of performance. But if you, if you flip that to where you were in the last 10, 15, 20 years, you must have to pinch yourself with the troubles that the club has, has been through. Obviously, you've been in and around it for, for such a long time. You've seen this journey that the club has, has been on. It, it's quite staggering, isn't it? It's a it's a football miracle. It really is. I, I still pinch myself now. I keep looking at the league table and thinking, my dear, how, how have we got this far? But it's all down to Eddie and the work he puts in, the staff he has around him, good people around him, the tactical decisions he, he makes. Uh, probably a, the, one of the, the bigger concerns is at some stage, somebody's going to test mm. the water with Eddie. I'm sure, you know, I've, he's had a go up Burnley and being up north. Um, I, c I can't see him going that way again. You know, he's, he's a pretty homely boy and, and he loves Bournemouth. And if there is anybody loyal in football anymore, it's Eddie Howe. And I can honestly see him sticking with us. But, 
you never know, do you? You know, if some of the big boys come in, I'm thinking London, I don't know, Tottenham, Arsenal, Chelsea, any of them, then it might just be one of them situations that he feels, I've got to take it. I don't know for sure. Do you but think that, 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 that time, John, at Burnley may also be a big factor in his decision if, when that, that comes along? You, you had something similar, didn't you? When you, when you were at Port Vale and Harry got on the phone just yeah, to yeah. move to Holmes Chapel, was, was, that, was that something in your, the back of your mind that you didn't really want to uproot? Well, no, I didn't want to go. But then I came down and I, I spoke to Harry and he'd done, he done the number that we, even when I was assistant manager, we continue to do today. When we bring players down... Um, and we're trying to sign them. We make sure that the, the, the schools, um, housing, we take them on the beach. We show them how beautiful it is. You know, Tony Pulis always used to say, we used to sign the wife sometimes, yeah. not the player. <laughs> it was really making them feel like they could make a home down here. And I think that's the case with any... I think those northern boys can come south, but I don't think the southerners go north so well, yeah. you know? Not unless there's a vast amount of money in it and they can't say no. So there, there could be something in that. He's, he's had a taste of up north. I don't personally think he, he would go that way again unless it was a big, big club. Who knows? He's never seen that in football. But um, at this moment in time, I think he's, he's really happy with the way things are going. And I've never seen him at that quite so happy and animated after the Fulham game. Usually he's, he's he's always very calm and collective, but but there was a, a little edge to his voice that, that was saying, "Yeah, we're not bad, you know, we're not a bad side." Yeah, I I, I see. And I spoke to you on Saturday in the press lounge, and I mentioned this to you that the last time I seen you play live was the first game of the season against Cardiff. Going back maybe last year, I've seen you maybe five, six times, some at home, some away. So every time I see the the team. There seems to be that little bit of progression in the way you're going forward. There's a real kind of togetherness, but it's that continuity with the way he plays. And I was very surprised, and I don't know what you thought of actually playing a back three on Saturday. We got the team in, and I just thought with the settled back four, four four one one or four four two, whatever you want to put it. And I know Josh King was missing on Saturday, but even going to that back three, which I don't think particularly worked last season on the couple of times I seen it. Again, Saturday, not a problem. And it's a testament to the work he clearly does on the on the training ground and how well those players are buying into it. Yeah, I think, you know, I think you've did it right. You've nailed it there. The, every signing that he's made, going back to last season with Jermaine, Begovic, uh, them sorts of people, we've got a little bit better each mm. time. And now he's done it again with, with Jefferson Lerma, who's come in and has really been outstanding. You know, he... OK, he had a, a couple of um, early games where he was getting used to things and he got a couple of bookings and that was a concern I, I, I thought I would have later on. But he's, he's tightened his, his tackling side of his game up and his distribution is good. He breaks things up. He's excellent defensively in front of that back four or the, or the three centre-halves, whichever way you play it. And he, he has, has definitely made us better, so... If, if Eddie can keep doing that and gradually keep making it even better, mm. who knows where you end up. But at this moment in time, things are, are, are looking very good and uh, everybody's extremely happy here at Bournemouth. I can show you. We've got the cup draw this evening. Uh, we're looking forward to that. You know, there's some big, big teams, of course, to play in and who knows which way the draw will go. But if we could get a bit lucky, uh, perhaps a home game, you know, Burton would be lovely. Yeah. You would think we could give them a good game. So we'll we'll wait and see how the draw goes. Yeah. You mentioned about the, the, the recruitment side of things has impressed me. He's gone in a in a, a different way in the last two, three windows maybe, where it has been concise. Even this summer, Brooks, Lerma coming in. I'm with you. That was the first time I've seen him live properly looking at him off the ball the positions he picks up the little steel that he brings to the heart of the midfield maybe a little bit different than what you already have in there with the likes of Gosling, Sermon who have all done very very well Lewis Cook still only relatively young in, in, um, in the grand scheme of things but he brings something different and likewise Brooks who I know you mentioned to me last week against Southampton yeah. didn't have his, his greatest game but then again on Saturday shows how good he can be well there's you know We've seen two sides of him in terms of where he's played. Um, we, we've seen him on left wing, but against Chelsea, 
Eddie put him in just behind the front two for a while. Just It was more of uh, a, we were trying to chase the game and trying to win it. But he opened them up twice and was unlucky not to score with a one-on-one. And he is, again, somebody who has definitely added uh, something to to the game. The, goal, the goals he's, he's scored and the goals he's made, it's, it's, very, it's very heartwarming. When you have players like that in your team, you know, and, and we've had it done to us over the last three seasons, the top teams have special ones that could do something in a moment, a free kick or something, a bit of individual flair, and it changes the whole game round. And we feel, in, in, certainly in Callum, uh, Fraser, uh, Brooksy and Kingy, we, we've got players there that if you, you know, you're really going to have to be on your toes when, when you come up against these lads. John, it'd be wrong, and, and I think in the media sometimes we're guilty of just focusing on the new signings, the new shiny toy, if you like. So it would be wrong not to mention the likes of Daniels, Cook, Francis, these players, Sermon, that have been there for many years that do provide a real security. And they also provide an environment, I'm sure, without knocking to come into. And it's just very stable. They've been the lifeblood in that as well. These boys have been the main... So that was John Williams, a uh, really nice fella. Bumped, as I said, bumped into him at the press lounge on Saturday at Fulham. Seen him a few times, so it was nice to speak to him, nice to get him on and give us a little flavour of, I suppose, what has been one of the surprise teams of the Premier League this year. But that is all we've got time for this week. As per usual, Keith Andrews' show is available to download on all the usual platforms. We shall see you next week.